Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Looking Ahead, Setting the Direction of Levy Investments for the Next Five Years. This is the second of a series of webinars following on from the annual Vegetable Industry Seminar at Hawk Connections. Today, we will hear from a number of guest speakers to discuss Hawk Innovation's process for developing the strategic investment plan over the next five years. The Vegetable Strategic Investment Plan is the roadmap that ensures levy investment decisions align with the industry for research, development, extension, and market investment priorities. Today, we will hear from Mark Spees, the industry strategic partner at Hort Innovation, Ray Montgomery, head of international trade at Hort Innovation, Byron de Kock, head of research and development at Hort Innovation, Jane Whiteman, head of extension Hort Innovation, and Adam Briggs, head of data insights at Hort Innovation. We will have a poll to come out after each of the speakers, um, and then we will conclude with a 10 minute Q&A at the end. Participants are welcome to put questions through as the session goes through, and we will answer the questions at the end. If there are any questions that we don't get to, we will endeavor to get through to them uh, post event. Now on that note, I would like to invite Mark Spies to give a bit of an introduction on the session. Over to you, Mark. Great, uh, thank you, Nathan. And um, great to be doing this in collaboration and partnership with Ausveg and Hort Innovation. Um, and as Nathan said, this is series two uh, of the webinar series. Um, I'm just covering off at just a high level. We've gone through process of how the SIP was going to be put together already in, in series one. So um, I'll just go through a high level today. Nathan's already touched on that the, the uh, strategic investment plan provides a roadmap to guide Hort, Invest, Hort Innovation's investments of levies and government contributions. It's for the next five years. So it goes from 2022 through to 2026. Uh, it should represent a balanced interest of the whole vegetable industry. So there's been a lot of consultation and we'll go through that. Um, its most important function is to ensure that the levy decisions align with um, yourselves, the growers, the industry priorities. And um, the, I guess the structure, the fourth point there is about the structure. The SIP or the Strategic Investment Plan is made up of four key outcome areas. And underneath those four key outcome areas are the strategies. So several of the outcome areas will have multiple strategies and, and the team will go through that today. And then under those outcomes, you have your KPIs and your impacts accordingly. So today is all about presenting a high level uh, overview of the draft uh, strategic investment plan. Um, how have we got here today? So um, how has the consultation been so far for the vegetable SIP or for the draft vegetable SIP? Uh, initially, we kicked off late last year and many of you would have been involved in the VegNet regional forums. There was well over 100 growers involved in that. There was 10 regional plans developed. Now we have one national plan. Um, so a lot of inputs there. That was part of the consultation. Uh, we've had strategic priorities from industry-led bodies like Ausveg and um, AFPA. Uh, strategic priorities coming in from the National Horticulture Research Na Network and the lead agency for vegetable industry is uh, QDAF or DAFQ and uh, rural R&D uh, for profit as well. Uh, this is the second series of the webinar, as I've, I've mentioned there. Hawk Connections, um, for everybody who did get up to Hawk Connections, we ran a, a workshop with the SIAP up at Hawk Connections. Unfortunately, just before Hawk Connections, a few people couldn't attend, so we did one-on-one -on -one interviews with all SIAP members as well. And we had industry feedback up at Hawk Connections as well. Uh, we've had an Ausveg and Hawk Innovation uh, SIP planning meeting, um, and also we've done one-on-one -on -one interviews with Ausveg board. Uh, during July, and we've done many one-on-one uh, -on -one grower and industry interviews as well during July and August. So that's how we've got to today. Where, where to next is the validation stage. Uh, we've got the webinar today, as Nathan said, the department heads will go through key outcomes, the polls and question and answers. Uh, the draft SIP is now on the Hort Innovation website, and there'll be a link today, and we'll get that out to everybody as well. And that'll be open till Friday, the 10th of September for detailed feedback. You can also ring me um, and we can do a one-on-one -on -one interview when, um, and arrange that. And then the final draft SIP will be created and put forward to the uh, SIAP, the vegetable SIAP or the joint vegetable SIAP on the 21st of September and to Ausveg. Um, we'll socialise that and then it will be finally approved uh, by the Hort Innovation Board. So I'll now hand over to the team to go through uh, the four key high-level outcomes. 
Thanks so much, Mark. Um, so kicking off, um, we're going to focus on demand creation, outcome one of the SIP. Um, my name is Bree Montgomery. Um, I am Head of International Trade. So the strategic intent of this outcome of demand creation is to maintain and strengthen consumer demand as the foundation for sustainable subs expansion of production and consumption in both domestic and international markets. It means the industry is investing to grow the value of Australian vegetable exports by supporting industry to market premium products, targeting higher value market segments, articulate the value proposition for Australian vegetables and pursue more targeted market and channel growth opportunities. Develop strong relationships across the value chain with a shared goal to grow the category. Enhance opportunities for value adding and packaging and improve stakeholder engagement with the food service sector and education of health benefits to consumers. We can break this down into three core functions under the international trade pillar looking at market access for international markets, export capability for international markets, and under market development, the strategies for investment are both focused on international and domestic. And I'll go into the detail now for how we separate those out. So we're focusing on market access, the strategy would be to pursue technical market access and market improvements for not only existing, but also new industry priorities, as well as addressing specific trade barriers, inhibiting export growth as required. The outcomes and benefits for you as an industry are increased trade and diversification of export market opportunities, and that pathways for exporting are commercially viable and sustainable for you and your organisations. We currently have uh, investment under negotiation with Ausveg, who will be the delivery partner for the Vegetable Industry Export Program running from 2021 to 2025. And this strategy will be delivered through this program. Moving across to export capability, the strategy is to deliver a suite of export capability and market development activities that cater for the different needs of mature, emerging and aspiring exporters. And we know how hard exporting is right now more than ever. We look at over the next five years, we want to make sure we're covering all areas of the industry that may not be exporting yet that want to, but also support those mature um, organisations that are exporting currently and what we can do here and now. So the benefits of this strategy are, again, increased trade and exports value, improved business to business engagement activities, stronger in-market relationships with trading partners, and increased consumer preference for Australian vegetables. Again, this strategy and investment will be supported uh, through the Vegetable Industry Export Program, running from 2021 to 2025, delivered by Ausveg. If we move to the third area of market development specifically, from an international point of view, the strategy is to target high value customers with product differentiation through best practice market intelligence, improved branding, and an increased focus on value adding. How can we support the vegetable industry to have a clear point of difference and value offering in our international markets? It's more important than ever as uh, the world becomes more competitive in this space. Domestically, we want to focus on supporting vegetable product differentiation and initiate stakeholder education activities, for example, the health benefits, and identify opportunities to increase the use of vegetables in the domestic food service industry. This has particularly come through in a lot of the consultation that food service um, is a focus area for the vegetable industry to develop new opportunities and of course provide more options for you to sell your product um, that's not their first grade quality. Uh, in terms of the outcomes, again, for the international markets, increased trade and exports value and that Australian vegetable product 
options are aligned with consumer needs and preferences. So the better we understand what our consumer wants and needs are, we can make sure that we're serving that up in the best high value markets to deliver their needs. From a domestic point of view, increased demand for Australian vegetables and new product offerings available to food service providers, an increased and diversified use of vegetables by the domestic food service industry. So I've outlined the five strategies under the demand creation outcome for you. Um, what you need to do now is go across to the poll question and for you to rank which is the top priority for the industry over the next five years out of those five strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bree, and thank you for your responses to that poll. We appreciate them very much. And obviously, if we grow demand, we need a supply to meet that demand. So that's what I'm going to speak to you now, the second outcome area of the SIP. And uh, the fact that we have industry supply and productivity and sustainability in pretty tough times always amazes me. So it's a testament to a really dynamic and resilient grower community. So on behalf of the team, the first thing I really want to do is reflect on the fact every time I go into Aldi, Coles or Woolworths, there's vegetables on the shelves. So thank you very much for, for, for that, just from a community perspective, and we acknowledge the resilience of the grower community. So thank you everyone, just on that, um, on, on that front. But going from there, just speaking about this outcome area, we're going to look at eight areas. They'll all be in the poll to follow later. So I'll outline each of the proposed strategies in the draft SIP for your comment. The first one is optimise input management to reduce costs, maintain yield quality in a changing climate. And we acknowledge that these inputs can even include labour. So that's a critical input needing to be managed and, and uh to, to be helped with reducing costs, but also uh, some of the natural inputs. Water's crucial, so water use efficiency, nutrient use efficiencies are critical uh, aspects to look at with strategies under this, uh, with projects rather under this strategy. The next one uh, speaks to effective integrated pest and disease management, IPDM for short, and as well as weed control, soil health, cover crops to improve productivity and sustainability. So this is another key strategy we've articulated in the draft SIP. You'll see a picture of one of our growers in the top right hand, or maybe it's your left hand corner of the screen. I'm not quite sure, but uh, that's David East in a cover crop uh, in West Australia. So David, if you're on the line, there you are. Uh, we lifted that from the final report of a project we'll showcase later, but Absolutely, this is a, a strategy that we still want to do some work in. I'll showcase this in a moment. Another thing are biosecurity threats, and we re recognise that you as growers absolutely uh, are in need of resilience and preparedness when it comes to biosecurity threats. Really sobering threats we've had to deal with lately have been fall army worm and serpentine leaf miner. So again, a key strategy in the draft SIP. The next one is efficiencies in waste. So on-farm organic waste, so crop waste and other organic waste, as well as inorganic waste on the farm as well. So those are key things that we're looking at um, developing projects under this strategy. So that's the first four. Let's go to the next four of the eight. And uh, up in the, again, the right or left-hand corner of your screens, a picture of a bean harvester on the Trandos family farm, again, over in WA. And um, 
this speaks to the first strategy, really, identify advances in automation and emerging technology to support labour use efficiency pre and post harvest. So what can we do in this space when it comes to automation? Um, in another industry, we're looking at driverless tractor technology. So what can we do in the vegetable space too? Um, and John, Jim, not proposing to automate your bean harvester, but there may be opportunities in this space, no matter the implements we use or the tractors that we're operating and scanning to find advances in this space that make a difference for growers. The next strategy area is protected cropping and to have a look at um, opportunities to adapt and improve protected cropping and intensive, intensive production technologies. The next one in our list here is product integrity and food safety services, uh, systems rather. So how can we support improvements in this space? And the last one, another thing that I'll showcase in a moment with the case study is that we have a strategy to prioritise crop protection gaps through the SARC process, which is the strategic agricultural review process and generation of crop data to support APVMA applications, label registrations, minor use permits for crop protection needs to ensure access to crop protection technology, or in other words, agrochemicals to help us control pests. So those are the eight outcome areas, or rather the eight strategies under the outcome area to industry supply, productivity and sustainability. So now I'd like to showcase the first project that we developed under the most recent SIP. It's got the code VG16068. It's entitled Optimising Cover Cropping for the Vegetable Industry. So obviously, if you look at the current strategy we're looking at, proposing to have in this current SIP, it would fit under the second one, Effective Integrated Pest and Disease Management, IPDM, Weed Control, Soil Health and Cover Crops improve productivity and sustainability. So that just shows you how this project would fit under this draft SIP. It's it, it also sat under a similar strategy in the previous SIP. So let's have a look at this case study and uh, see why I want to showcase it. Our grower here made this quote. He said, the advancement in cover cropping has been the most advanced single change to farming I've seen in 30 years. He said, it's an absolute game changer. So really, that's what we want from our, our research projects is for them to be a game changer for you as vegetable growers. So let's showcase how this was, but really this is the aspiration for each and every project we uh, procure under the strategic investment plan. So let's uh, go to the next slide and play a video of one of our growers in New South Wales this time. Nation was good. Like any trial, we have a control, and the control is further over there, where we, we left it bare. So it didn't have a cover crop in it over the, over the winter. And what we found there was it crusted, and this didn't. So the cover crop and the strip till have to go hand in hand. The tilt here was much better than where we'd had it fallow all summer. If I put a shovel in here, there's no compaction. The shovel goes in. You know, the, the tilt in the soil is much better. The weed burden where it was fallow was quadruple or even more than what we have here it'll be interesting to see but i'm sure that when we come into here to harvest we won't have any issues with with the dirt on the bottom of the fruit you know the the trash in the furrows you know will be what the fruit's sitting on but this will be a really really cheap alternative to plastic and i hate plastic so uh, anything to get rid of plastic is a good thing and i think that this is a very viable option if I look at the whole system and which, which one I would go with, it is definitely this. And before we started filming, I was talking to our agronomist about right, uh, the crops that we're going to be putting cucurbits in next year. We better start getting them ready for this now because um, where I've got strip till and cover crop and then I've got no cover top, it is, it is chalk and cheese. So... Very good. Thank you. Cool. Why can he... Is that good? We might get to watch it again. So essentially to be a game changer, we need to deliver tools for you as growers. So this, I'm not expecting everyone to read it. You absolutely can see this on the Soil Wealth website with all the resources and even those videos featuring numerous of our growers. And thank you, Ed Fagan, for a guest appearance if you're online. Um, but essentially you can see in this table the species of cover crop 
and the value that they add to your farm. And if you go across it, it's not all in the screen, but you can even see the areas that these cover crops would work. So as our growers said, an absolute game changer, potentially things we want to pursue in the next SIP. What do cover crops do? We know they can confer pre-emergent weed control, but what can they do for soil borne diseases? How do they affect the beneficial microbes? All research questions that potentially we want to investigate under the new SIP. So for us, a key strategy in the SIP, but today for your consideration and comment uh, in the feedback process. Let's showcase one last project, and that's the minor use permits. I'm calling it case study. And essentially I've combined three strategies in the SIP here. It's prioritised the crop protection gaps through the SARP process, generation of crop data to support the um, APVMA applications for label registrations and minor use permits for your crop protection needs as a grower. So let's just look at the process in the next slide. Essentially, in the slide, you can see a SARP, a Strategic Agrochemical Review Process. On our website, the Hort Innovation, there are 24 vegetable SARPs. The example I've put in the screen, which you perhaps can't read, but it's on the website, is snow pea and sugar snap pea SARP that was done in April 2021. What a SARP does is confirm the industry priority diseases, pests, and weeds. And then through that SARP, we can look at, well, what are the crop protection needs and potentially work to help you to develop a label registry or, or the agrochemical suppliers, rather, to develop a label registration for use of that chemistry on your crop. Or if that's not something feasible, we can look at developing a minor use permit for that crop commodity. And we have 194 of these minor use permits. Again, a very important uh, strategy under this outcome area from our perspective, but again, keen for your feedback. So that outlines this outcome area too around industry supply productivity and sustainability. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you now. And on your screen will come an opportunity to pick two priorities in these eight that I've articulated today. Thank you for that, Byron, and uh, thank you everybody for filling in that poll. Uh, I'm Jane Whiteman and I'm Head of Extension based in Brisbane, and I'm here to introduce the three strategies that fit under the Extension and Capability Outcome. The, uh, the first strategy really is there to ensure that outcomes from research, development and trade investments are easily, easily accessible to, to you, to the growers. Um, so that industry is able to develop skills and knowledge and introduce new practices into their businesses and to have on-ground, positive on-ground impact, especially in the areas that uh, the levy funds in the uh, demand and supply areas. And that includes areas in food safety, waste, soil management and water management, biosecurity and use of data to assist in decision making. A great example of one of the projects that supports um, meeting this strategy is the Soil Wealth and ICP project, which is in its second iteration. It's a national extension project. Its aim is to increase productivity and profitability and sustainability by extending the results from soil wealth research. And there's a lot of research that's delivered through this um, 
through this project via demonstration sites. And you may recognize yourself on one of the photographs uh, that's, on, that's on the slide. And, um, and if you have a look at the, um, at the demonstration sites that are listed on the slide, you will see that is just an example of just a handful of demonstration sites. But as you can see, those sites are scattered across the country from the Northern Territory down to Tasmania. The investment is also supported by a website, a soilwealth.com.au. And on that site are um, a huge number of resources that are available to yourself. And that includes articles, bulletins, fact sheets, posters, podcasts. Also, the, um, the project delivers a lot of webinars that are recorded and can be found on the website. And the project also does a lot of global scans to ensure that um, the project doesn't just share research from, um, from, the, from, from Australia, but also shares its um, research from uh, international avenues as well. Moving on to the second strategy, and this acknowledges that you um, prefer to learn from each other. Growers really enjoy and get a lot and benefit a lot from learning from each other. And, uh, and this was supported uh, three years ago when Hort Innovation did their roadshows and gathered information from industry and growers to inform our company's strategic plan. And you were telling us that um, you were keen to learn from each other, you were keen to learn from other um, horticultural industries and for us to develop opportunities for this to happen for industry. The VegNet, um, investment is a great example of an investment that supports this strategy. It increases knowledge and skills and, um, and encourages adoption of best practices from research and development um, project outcomes and outputs. And it also has an added advantage of um, engaging throughout the supply chain, which supports the development of trusted networks, which are integral um, for, for building uh, business. business. The, there was a review of VegNet, and from that review, um, we were sent strong messages in relation to the project. And these were telling us that um, this project has a good flow of information and good access to information from, in, from levy investments. Also, it supports growing important networks. It allows feedback from industry back to researchers. And there was a lot of strong support for growers um, for VegNet to continue in the regions going forward. The third, out, the third strategy is all about growing a sustainable industry through developing leaders and encouraging people into the industry and to view it as a long-term career choice. Uh, two examples uh, from the Leadership Frontier Fund um, that have been supported by the industry are the Global Masterclass and also the Graduate Engagement Program. The, the Global Masterclass um, is uh, show support to the industry. The actual vegetable levy has invested in a number of um, scholarships for this program over a number of years, and it supports the industry in long-term development of growing leaders. It's a 10-month program and um, Participants end up um, with a, um, after working hard and putting the effort in, end up with a diploma uh, for horticultural business. We actually, Hort Innovation actually um, invested in a review for the program and we found that participants um, that were surveyed, 83% of them said the course uh, improved their personal development and professional skills. And 90% of participants surveyed said that a key benefit for them um, of the course was further development of their networks, um, social and also business networks. The graduate engagement program encourages uh, high quality people into the industry. There's two phases to the program. The first phase is in the last year of, um, of a university degree where students spend 12 weeks uh, with, uh, with a company working on a, working on a project. And if all parties get on, um, quite often there's an offer of employment for the first 12 months after the student has finished their last year at university. That 12 months is also supported by a, a leadership course and, um, and other graduates go to that leadership course as well. So there's a cohort of students that, um, that participate. We also reviewed this, 
program recently and um, the findings told us that um, the investment promoted career pathways in horticulture, also increased the number of graduates entering the industry, uh, created a greater awareness uh, of businesses to take on graduates. And a really, a really interesting uh, finding was that um, some of the graduates who are actually considering entering the broad acre industry uh, changed their mind and decided to, um, to choose horticulture instead, which is a great outcome. So I've just finished the overview of the three strategies that support um, this outcome. And I'd like to invite you to, um, to uh, answer this, these poll questions. Thank you. All right, uh, so we're now here at the, the final outcome uh, area of your draft strategic investment plan um, and it concerns business insights. So my name's Adam Briggs, uh, I'm the head of the data insights team and my team will be uh, responsible for any investment uh, that, that occurs within this outcome area. So I'm here to take you through as we have with the other outcome areas, uh, the, the overall strategic intent and then the uh, supporting strategies for investment. So. Uh, the business insights uh, outcome is is a really uh, foundational uh, outcome, if you like, for supporting the vegetable industry. Uh, and the main uh, priority for this uh, for the investment in this outcome area is to provide uh, basically the the knowledge um, through through data and insights to support growers uh, make more informed decisions uh, in their business, and also to underpin uh, some of the aspects of the other outcome areas that uh, with with um, learnt about so far today as well. So there's four strategic areas which will, will follow on the coming slides, but in summary, uh, they can be broken up really as follows. Um, there's, there's effectively two sides uh, to business insights that, that we will be investing against. The first side concerns uh, insights that regard the production and supply uh, capacity for, for the vegetable industry. So, you know, we've seen, um, you know, in the past, some, some investment um, undertaken in the vegetable industry and in other areas, in other industries um, concerning things like uh, production forecasts uh, and, and benchmarking uh, performance for industry. Uh, but we're going to be taking, you know, another refreshed look uh, at how we can deliver um, production and supply insights uh, for the vegetable industry, which I'll be taking you through in a moment. And the other main area for uh, this uh, this this uh, outcome area from a strategic perspective is business insights that relate to the consumer and the market. So we learnt a lot about uh, that, particularly in uh, the first outcome on demand creation. But it's you know really important to be in the best place to invest meaningfully uh, into to building markets um, to ensure that we've got the underpinning uh, consumer data uh, and and understanding of of behaviours and attitudes that that relate to uh, consumer purchase to ensure that we're actually setting ourselves up for success. And also that you, from a business perspective, can also have an understanding of what makes consumers tick uh, and, and use that to you know, drive your decision-making. So that's really realistically the two core areas. And, and we're able to then draw on that data that we have to also inform our progress and our performance across the SIP as well. So again, it's a very foundational area. It sort of cuts across uh, the other outcome areas that you've been uh, learning about so far today. So that's, that's the strategic intent. So moving to the four strategies uh, that underpin the outcome area, the first strategy, uh, as, as I alluded to previously, uh, is, is concerning the supply uh, um, understanding of, 
of uh, the, the industry and its productive capacity. So as you can see here, it's, you know, it's summarised as basically um, any investment that is concerned with collecting industry data to inform uh, in-season and, and longer-term business planning. So there's a range of approaches that could be drawn on to, to deliver against this. Uh, I've mentioned crop forecasting as one of those. Uh, another example, um, which we've had some early feedback on, but you know, more around looking around, well, how can we become more forward-looking and, and understand um, you know, what other factors might drive productive capacity uh, for the vegetable industry through looking at predictive tools, for example, that might draw on, on climate uh, or weather, weather data, for example. And another example, uh, which we have um, piloted in, in the recent SIP, which we could, again, uh, continue down this path uh, in, in this new strategic investment plan, is looking at uh, having uh, data available from a, from a market price perspective uh, so we can understand the dynamics at play in terms of how different vegetable commodities are performing throughout the year in terms of the market prices that they've been achieving across the various wholesale markets. And that information can be used to inform, you know, basically, from a grower's perspective, you know, where they might be best placed in terms of their, um, in terms of, you know, their growing um, approach, if they're targeting the right time of year for, for achieving the best price. Um, and also for for their long yeah for that longer term planning as well. So an example there of the type of data that can be produced through investment um, in this area is on the screen. Um, and again, there's there's a range of opportunity for for continuing to evolve um, this data in a way that really engages growers uh, to basically help help inform their their um, planning and their in their engagement with the market. So uh, that's the first outcome. Sorry, the first strategic area. The second strategic area relates to that other sort of side of the coin, if you like, as, as Byron's alluded to, you know, we've, we, can, we can supply, but if we don't have uh, the market, then, you know, we're not going to be very, um, very well off. So it's in, this area is, you know, again, driving home the fact that we need to understand the consumer uh, in order to, to, you know, maximise that demand opportunity. So, um, and again, this was touched on in, in, out, in outcome one as well with, with Bree's presentation of, uh, the demand uh, creation. But again, this is all about ensuring we've actually got the consumer data to draw on to identify those investment opportunities, um, both you know, internally from the way we use your levy, but also from your business perspective in terms of you know, how you as a business can, can better engage with your consumer and that you're informed that you know, the, the direction that you're heading you know, down as a business is also aligning with what uh, you know, is, is the most opportune um, areas for, for consumer growth and customer growth. So an example of what this uh, has looked like, uh, I'm hoping that most of you on the call will be familiar with the Harvest to Home initiative. And that's been a, a, an initiative, a, a partnership that, that Hort Innovation has um, invested your levy in um, with uh, the Nielsen Group. And we've been able to facilitate a very broad dissemination of fantastic um, consumer insight information which looks at uh, consumer behaviours and also usage and attitude considerations. So you can identify what are some of the triggers and what are some of the barriers to purchasing different types of vegetable crops and ensuring that you're on the front foot in responding to some of those areas so that you're maximising that demand opportunity. So we're looking to extend this investment uh, into the future through the Business Insights outcome to continue to ensure we're getting growers the most up-to-date insights uh, around that consumer opportunity so they can continue to maximise uh, their demand and their engagement with consumers. Uh, and there's another, a couple of other initiatives as well, things like the Phenomenon Educational Resource is another example of where we could take things, and also the Veducation website refresh, which again are, are examples in the past, but again, they, they're about building that business insight so we can, so we can drive that demand opportunity um, moving forward. So moving on now to the third strategic area of uh, the business insights um, outcome, this is a very straightforward strategy, I might say. It's, it's effectively cons concerned with ensuring that we have um, up-to-date trade data um, to guide our export activities. So again, in outcome one, we were learning about all of the initiatives that we will be undertaking to develop our markets and in, you know, position our products and build that capability. But unless we have access to the data uh, that, that sits beneath all of that activity to validate our performance and do some of that scoping activity to identify where those opportunities need to sit, then, you know, we're not going to be very well off. So this strategy is all, again, a very much an enabler strategy, a foundational area 
ensuring that we have access to that trade data um, to guide those export activities. And on the screen is an example, again, of how we've been able to utilise that trade data uh, for a range of different initiatives. And the, the initiative you see on the screen, which you may or may, you, you should be familiar with, I'm hoping, is the, the Horticulture Statistics Handbook resource. And this is a screenshot of, a, of the, one of the trade dashboards that have been produced through that handbook, um, which relates to, in this case, broccoli and cauliflower uh, export trade. Um, but again, all of this insight is underpinned by having access uh, to the data, um, you know, to enable that analysis to occur. And similarly as well with the vegetable um, export development um, initiative, having this export data is essential to validate our performance and to ensure we're, on, we're, we're, we're making meaningful progress um, and, and making a difference um, in terms of those export figures. So, yeah, a very simple strategy, but again, a, a very critical strategy to, to ensuring the success of the fund um, as we move over these next five years. Now, the final strategic area, uh, I did mention it before, and it concerns benchmarking performance. And it's, it's, it's more around this supply side capability. But again, you know, building business insight, we really need to ensure that growers are position to understand what makes good performance um, come to life. So benchmarking is a fantastic initiative where, you know, through connecting with your, your business performance metrics and understanding, you know, how you perform, you know, not only in the field from a production perspective, but also the financial side of your business is an excellent way to ensure that you're going to be maximising the resources that you have on hand, um, you know, to, to ensure you're getting the best results on both of those sides of the coin. And we've actually piloted this uh, investment and some of the Western Australian growers, if there are any on the line, may recall the initiative that was delivered in partnership with Vegetables WA, where we, we did undertake a, an extensive benchmarking initiative there. And, you know, there were some great examples through that investment of growers who were participating through that program had basically been able to, you know, experience a new light of understanding their, the way that their business performs. And we're able to use and draw on the resources provided through that investment to really, you know, basically change the way that they were running some aspects of their business to better give them, you know, more valuable um, results from both a production perspective and a financial perspective. So, you know, we, we had really firm evidence that, you know, again, by providing this type of data and getting grower participation, you know, and, and driving that business insight, we're, we're, we're going to be continuing to, to develop our capability and capacity and ensuring we're getting the best um, outcome. So we're looking in this area again, because of the various, you know, regional diversity, um, you know, undertaking initiatives in benchmarking on a regional basis, at least to start with, and then potentially scaling that into a national um, initiative as well. So that's that's the, uh, the final strategy um, under the Business Insights outcome concerning benchmarking. So again, as you've been doing for each of the other outcome areas, we will now go to a poll, and you can rank uh, your, you know, your your top strategy uh, under this business insights. And we really appreciate your feedback. So thanks very much. All right, well, thank you to all of the, uh, the speakers for providing us with the insights on the various outcomes of the draft SIP. It's really good to get some insight into what the plan is um, looking like over the next five years. And I'm sure there'll be some great feedback to come through from participants, not only from this webinar, but also through the other activities that have taken place over the course of this year and last year. So we've got a few questions that have come through um, during the course of the webinar now that I will read out and um, we might just get all the, the panellists to answer those for whatever the appropriate um, question is. So we'll start at the top and the question that's come through has been, 
what are the available vegetable levy funds this financial year and over the five years of the new vegetable industry strategic plan? So, um, Neil, you're online. It might be a best place for yourself, but anyone else, feel free to jump in. Okay. Thank you, Nathan. Okay. At this point in time, the available funds um, for uh, investment, which are unallocated, there is approximately uh, $4 million uh, dollars which have not been allocated to any uh, funding at all. And that is based on a levy income of $10 million, which is uh, on the conservative side. But at this point in time, there is uh, this year, there is $4 million available. Following year, um, it jumps up to 7.5 based on the current expenditure. And then going forward, it then increases to approximately $9 million. Now, obviously, that will be subject to change, whatever investment is made this year. But at this point in time, there is $4 million unallocated uh, available for expenditure. Fantastic. Thanks, Neil. And just by extension, a question that's come through um, has been, how do people see the allocations in terms of budget setting for each outcome of the strategic investment plan? Where, where does one go to view that information? That should be on our website, but I would have to uh, confirm with um, Adam. I think there's, there's some work that has been done on that yeah. if Adam wants to jump in. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, we do. We have reported on that um, over the last you know couple of years online and um, we are now going through this renewal process. So we're going to be you know updating the, the references to each of the outcome areas. So we're going to have to basically go through and realign all of our legacy investment to ensure that they're matching up to this to these new outcome areas. And we'll be taking a similar approach to reporting that going forward, where we will be allocating the expenditure uh, across each of the outcome areas. So it's really transparent for growers to be able to understand exactly you know where the balance of that investment sits. Um, so so that will yeah be the be the case going forward. And it's all available online under the, the vegetable grower page of the uh, of the website. I could just make a comment too, Nathan, just on um, the theory too, and that is traditionally it's always been hard to invest on the demand side. It's always been a challenge in the absence of a marketing levy. It's it's normally easier to identify priorities on the on the productivity supply uh, side, but over the last 10 years that's been a real challenge. So we absolutely want to grow demand and yearn to have as many investments in that space as possible. Excellent. Thank you all for the response. Another question that's come through, how can we get more adoption across the vegetable industry? So I'm open to, the, to any of the speakers to answer that one. Um, I might have a stab at that, Nathan. Thank, thank you very much. I don't think there's one answer to that. And I think um, it's, a, it's a gradual process and we can build on um, an ad adoption as years as years go on. I think I think there's a number of things. One is that I think that if we can bring growers together to um, to, to to work together and learn from each other, um, that is a huge benefit to the industry. So if we can provide more avenues for that, obviously with COVID, it's been quite a challenge. But um, the industry development projects have been able to continue bringing growers together, even if it has been over Zoom or, or Skype. I think also bringing growers into developing projects before they're actually, um, before they're actually contracted. So we ensure that we've, we understand the true needs of growers and understand the end result. And the end result is for on-ground impact for, you know, for growers. So taking a, a systems approach to, um, to our investments going, you know, going forwards. And, in relation to the, the, the VegNet investments, each of the 10 uh, regional development offices uh, that are allocated across the nation, they have been developing, well, they have developed regional plans, uh, regional extension plans, and they've done that with a huge amount of input from growers in their regions. And through that, they've identified the high priorities which they'll be concentrating on um, in extension over the next few years. Excellent. Thank you, Jane. Appreciate that. Another question just come through um, Q&A here is, uh, are you also recording organic sales and exploring organic market opportunities?
Yeah, we haven't explicitly. Uh, I think the thing to recognise there is the, the structure of the, the levy uh, at hand. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's certainly an opportunity going forward because you know, obviously there has been a lot of growth in organics um, across the board. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, very interested if there's further feedback around how we could look to incorporate organic uh, sales data into our, into our mix. We'd, we'd love to hear that. So that would be a great one to follow up with. Thanks, Adam. Um, next question has come through. The draft SIP mentions delivery of a consumer insights strategy as a KPI. What are the elements of this strategy and how do they relate to the business insights areas? So Adam, you can probably um, stay, on the, stay on the line. Yeah, no, glad you brought it up. And it's good that we're discussing, um, yeah, consumer insights and, and the demand side um, of this. But, yeah, we've, we've put in um, basically under the, under the SIP, you'll notice in each of the, each of the um, strategic areas, we've got key performance indicators that, that will basically be used to, to measure success of our investment. And under the, uh, the um, consumer insights uh, strategic area, there's, there's basically been a strategy that, that we've, we independently worked on um, with, a, with a consultant at the end of 2020. Um, and that basically is a bit of the, bit of the guidance for what, for what good looks like around consumer insights. So, you know, we've identified an opportunity to drive a lot more consistency in, in what's delivered. And we've, we've started that journey through, through the Harvest to Home portal um, but there's other areas um, of that of that strategy which we're really looking to bring to life uh, into the into the subsequent um, strategic investment plan. So some of those areas, um, you know, in addition to understanding, you know, the consumer behaviours, um, we're looking at building a much richer profile around usage and attitudes. So we've got a little bit of that um, at the moment through Harvest to Home that applies to veggies, but really like trying to build that out and provide a lot more, um, you know, rich depth to to that area will be. Um, something that will be focus, a focus um, through investment into that area. And we're also looking to further expand our capability around understanding the sensory performance of products. So, you know, that could, that could look at, at, for example, different um, aspects to, I don't know, novel, um, you know, we've seen, you know, purple cauliflower, for example, um, is something that I've seen on my local woolly shelf now, but I don't think I saw it 12 months ago. So it's, you know, those types of sensory areas that we can continue to evolve and explore our understanding in. Uh, that this consumer insight strategy will, you know, investment will, will continue to, to support. And tying that all together is being able to really effectively communicate the findings of the work. So that part of the strategy is all about amplifying and leading and really, you know, setting up a, a, a space for, for all of that material to be accessible in an engaging way for the growers. So uh, that's, that's really the consumer insight strategy in, in terms of what that involves and how the investment will support it. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, another one that's um, quite timely on the back of the announcement with the, the progress on the Ag Visa is how can the levy be used to address uh, labour shortages? Thank you for that question, Nathan, and whoever supplied it to. Um, essentially, we know what the levy can't do as well. That's really where a critical function is taken up by Ausveg, and that's on the um, agri-political side and to be able to lobby government. But one of the things we can do is develop insights. So Adam spoke of that. So the business insights that will really help inform anything that the peak industry body needs to take to government to make the case. So that, that's a key thing we can do. But in, in the uh, strategy too, we've proposed uh, KPIs that are around automation to help with labour use efficiency. So we're really keen to explore that. Those are absolutely things we can do. And then the other thing we find that's needed we may be able to automate, but we need to also help growers upskill to achieve adoption of this technology on farm. So that's another key thing we can do, really help growers through the R&D program be able to use automation technology, be it on the pre-harvest or even post-harvest. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Byron. Another one that um, you might be able to answer while you're there as well is, by extension of that, how can we get more people into the industry, both through the levy, but just in general terms? Also another critical thing, and I think um, even off the back of that answer I just gave, automation, helping um, gr grow the need for skilled labour, making the industry attractive to graduates, uh, exciting to work in. I think all of what the R&D program will really attract the youth 
uh, to the industry and make it attractive. It's no longer just getting your hands dirty day in, day out, 60 hours a week, back-breaking work, but we really need um, an upskilled workforce and the R&D program and the transformations that it aims to make on behalf of the industry will really make the industry attractive. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate that. Jane, did you want to add to that as well? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, you know, I, I, um, I support, you know, what, what Byron's saying. I also think there are a lot of initiatives um, in the, within, the, within the states and territories and federally in encouraging people into agriculture and horticulture. I think that it's it's a timely um, it's it's time to actually identify where the gaps are, and if if we do want to invest the levy in this area, where is the best? Where can where can we invest and actually you know get a good return and not duplicate other things, other programs that are happening na nationally? Where are the gaps? How do we join those gaps? You know, uh, as I said, where where can we highly prioritise our in, our investment? So it has a meaningful outcome for industry. Excellent. Thank you both for that. That's great. A um, couple more that have come through um, before we wrap up at four o'clock. Um, are there any plans to extend the soil wealth extension concept to sharing innovations in precision agriculture, including veg growers who plan to transition into protected cropping? Without a doubt, the soil wealth um, an ICP uh, extension program is, is one of our flagship investments. Um, the, the project will come to, to, an, to an end uh, next, next year. And obviously we will be considering along with uh, industry, uh, you know, whether to um, have a, a new iteration of that, of that investment. Um, there is a Frontier uh, Smart Farms project happening at the moment, and, um, and that will also um, cover some of those issues you just brought up, Nathan. But, you know, obviously with projects that, that are successful and continue to get supported by industry, um, then there is a consideration to, to uh, continue investing one way or another. Excellent. Thank you, Joan. Appreciate that. Um, a couple more that have come through before we finish up. Is R&D or market research into labour sentiment and job satisfaction something which Hoard Innovation would approve for R&D spending? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a go at that one. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, I think, yeah, there, there certainly is scope uh, for that. I think it's important to recognise that that we have, you know, um, we have done some, some study around the seasonal labour um, requirements, uh, you know. Although, yeah, if there is if there is further further um, interest and and requirement for helping growers to understand sentiment, uh, that could also be you know captured um, in in ongoing business inside activity, particularly under that under that supply side. Or how how you know we can we can we can have all of the technology in the world, but if we don't have the people there to do it and they're not satisfied, then um, yeah, that's that's certainly also an important consideration. So yeah, certainly um, open to to looking at that in more detail, and be great to follow up with some more detailed feedback um, in your review of, of of the SIP from from that individual. So um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Excellent. Thanks very much. We've probably got time for a couple more to come through. So firstly. Um, if people are wanting to provide feedback directly through to anyone here on the panel, what is the best process for um, delivering that through um, to, to Horn Innovation? Nathan, I might answer that. The, um, the draft SIP's now online. So uh, there will be, I think there was a communication that went out this morning and, and we'll make sure that we're working with Sean and your team and the Ausveg team to get communications to everybody. Um, so it is up online. Um, jump online, have a look at it and um, review that over the next couple of weeks. And you can supply written feedback on that format, or um, I'll also make sure that my contact details, so if we want to do a one-on-one -on -one interview with myself and, and do it over the phone, because it's a lot easier and you can be in the tractor, et cetera, and we can, we can talk on the phone, we can do that as well, um, and direct myself as the industry strategic partner. Excellent, thank you, Mark. And the last couple that we'll run through quickly, um, in preparing this draft SIP was a review of the previous SIP done. Um, considering there has been considerable investment in the previous SIP, it would be good to have it evaluated. So just a bit of an overview of um, what's been done prior. 
Yeah, I might start that off and Adam might want to go into a little bit of details. Um, yeah, absolutely is the answer. Um, a full review of the previous SIP uh, expenditure based on outcomes. And I think there was a question earlier on about um, uh, spend per outcomes, and that was done on the previous SIP as well. Um, and we also presented that to the SIP as well uh, and had that online. So Adam might want to dive a little bit deeper on how that came about. And we did present that in webinar series one. That was actually part of the webinar questions that we had through in uh, series one, uh, show, showcasing the expenditure per SIP outcome as well. Yeah, definitely. I'd recommend um, taking a look at that that um, first webinar because we, that was really where we did um, review uh, that process because, yes, it's a great point. You know, there's we, it's really important to reflect on all of the great work that we've done over the last five years to ensure that we're positioning ourselves to, to take the most effective steps going forward. So, yeah, we Port Innovation has um, taken a detailed and comprehensive look at, you know, how all of these um, investments over the last five years have made meaningful contributions. Uh, and we'll be looking to, you know, come out with some more externally facing material from a SIP performance analysis perspective. So we can really close the book on the 2017 to 2021 SIP. Um, and it's important, obviously, to recognise that we have taken on a lot of that learning in framing up um, the focus for, for this uh, new SIP going forward. So, yeah, it's a, a great question. I'm looking forward to delivering on that um, shortly as well for you all. Excellent. Thank you both. And just finally, um, the export strategic plan, when do you anticipate that being ready? Uh, the vegetable export strategy was completed in May of this year. And if you contact Michael Coate or Andrea uh, Lynn, they'll be able to provide it to you. That was funded in the um, vegetable export program that's been running for the last six years. Thank you. No problem. All right. That's um, everything we have time for now, just ticked over 401. So thank you to all the participants and speakers today for taking the time. It was um, a really good conversation and we look forward to the final webinar, which will be taking place on the 22nd of September. And we'll be discussing the uh, recently detected American serpentine leaf miner. So look forward to seeing you all then for the final webinar of this particular series and the other uh, bits and pieces that Ausveg and Hot Innovation are also putting together over the upcoming months. So thank you all and um, have a good afternoon.